Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever or whenever you happen to be viewing this. An important tool of data science is statistics. In part one of this module, we focused on the general power of statistics to persuade and how one can easily be deceived by pseudo-statistics. Our suggestion in part one, however, is that if you could be conversant in or familiar with the various statistical shapes and what you need to be aware of when considering a statistic, then perhaps it will be a little harder for someone to baffle you with statistical boulder dash or nonsense, if you will. Likewise, perhaps if you leverage this understanding in your own presentations, you might be a bit more effective at communicating your statistical observations to others. This section will cover four key statistical shapes. Then in part three of this module, we will look at the statistical concept of correlations, and that discussion will lend itself to a discussion of the scientific method. Before proceeding, I would like to take a moment to thank the Mavo Institute for giving me this opportunity to speak with you. The Mavo Institute is the brainchild of Martin van der Heiden. I encourage you to take a moment to check out the Mavo Institute website, as well as the team's profiles. One of Martin's key hopes is to tap experienced experts to address topics or problems at hand. As such, the team behind this presentation also includes John Murphy, a practicing tenured digital media executive, and myself, Dr. Paul Fielding. With that said, Let's take a look at data science at statistics, part two, discerning truths with data science and the importance of shapes. In this section, we'll familiarize you with four key shapes. The idea being that if you can be conversant in or manage situations that lend themselves to these key shapes, you will probably know more about the nature of the statistics at hand than most people around you. The first of these that we will consider is the binomial or Bernoulli distribution. This is most useful when discussing option type questionnaires or yes-no surveys. Then we'll familiarize you with the normal distribution or bell curve. This is most useful for measures that vary equally about a central point being the mean or average value. This leads us to a discussion of the Poissonian distribution. Basically, our concern here is when data gets bunched up against a limiting value and the average value does not equal the most commonly occurring point, how do you work with that? What do you need to be aware of? Lastly, we will look at the Pareto chart, a handy tool for identifying what is mostly responsible for the issue you are studying. Where do you focus limited resources and what can you expect to accomplish? In part three, we will look at the scatter diagram, correlations, and what is the difference between being statistical versus scientific. Our premise here is that if you're familiar with these shapes and understand the significance of them, the significant parts of these shapes and how to work with them, it will be a lot harder for someone to lead you down a spurious statistical path of, to deception. Likewise, perhaps this understanding will help you be more effective at communicating statistical results to others. So as I say, with no further ado, the first type of distribution we often hear about is the binomial distribution or the Bernoulli distribution. The Bernoulli distribution is a specific case of a binomial distribution in which the answer is either a yes or no type of question. Political polling often uses Bernoulli distributions to report on how people may vote for a particular candidate. As such, you will often hear a confidence interval mentioned. For example, this survey is accurate to within plus or minus 4%. That confidence interval is determined by the sample size taken in consideration to the entire population they think the sample is representing. The normal distribution or bell curve is another common shape used to represent large pools of data. A normal distribution most commonly occurs when the samples can be best represented by the mean or average value, which occurs most frequently and the data varies equally around this mean point or average value. The sample size and how the data varies about the mean helps us to estimate the standard deviation or variance. In a normal distribution, the standard deviation tells us how far one must go from the mean in order to account for about 68% of the occurrences in the situation being observed. Now the standard deviation is an important number much more important than many people might realize. Some may say that the standard deviation of a normal distribution is an arbitrary number or artifact of the mathematics, 
behind the representation of the normal distribution. But keep in mind, the mathematics was developed to describe what we find in nature. The standard deviation is a point in the normal dis distribution curve where the nature of the curve changes significantly. The curve on one side of this point has one nature, and on the other side of this point, it has a different nature. As such, this concept repeatedly appears and is echoed throughout society, nature, and all sorts of places you wouldn't expect. For example, consider decision-making. While for some things, we only require a simple majority of voters to make a decision, if the decision requires making a fundamental change to how we think, say, for example, making a constitutional change to our club or organization, Robert's Rules tells us that a supermajority must be in agreement, where a supermajority is often defined as two-thirds of the voters. To propose a change to the U.S. Constitution, two-thirds of both houses must be in agreement that the change is necessary. There is actually a lot of math behind the power dynamics of how the U.S. Constitution establishes things. The point for us is to really know something about your measure, you must at least account for two-thirds of the variance, or plus or minus, at least the standard deviation about the measure. Thus, it is virtually meaningless to talk about the mean or average value of something without talking about or understanding the standard deviation about this mean. And we'll get to this in an example later on in the presentation. Sometimes when data bunches up against physical realities, say for example, consider situations where you cannot go below zero, the shape of the data takes on a form where the mean or average value is not equal to the most frequently occurring point. When data takes on a shape like this, it's called Poissonian. In cases like this, it may be more useful to report on the mode or the most commonly occurring point rather than reporting on the mean. There are methods for finding the variance in a Poissonian distribution, and these differ from how one computes the standard deviation in a normal distribution. However, one point you need to be mindful of here is that when reporting data on data that is Poissonian, if you report on the variance as being plus or minus some value about a particular point, be careful that you do not report numbers that violate the physical boundaries of the situation. Let me give you an example from personal experience. My client had his team presenting to me about a control on a device where that control could only be set between zero and 10. Now, poor Andy, he got up and he started to report that he found that the clients used this setting at an average value of eight with a standard deviation of three. It wasn't long before his colleagues were teasing him with comments like, so uh, how did they set it to 11? Had Andy realized his data was Poissonian-like, he might have more effectively made his point by saying the mode or most commonly used setting is nine and 10, with two thirds of all customer usage accounted for by settings greater than seven. Clearly, the customer is seeking more out of this feature, and we need to redesign this feature to meet the customer's needs. By the way, even if the nature of the data tells us that it is Poissonian, that is to say, limited by some boundary, if the boundaries are reasonably far away from the mean, and the mean and the mode are about the same, then even if the data is technically Poissonian, it may be reasonably represented by a normal distribution, as in the case of the black curve appearing in this graphic. Ah, Vilfredo Pareto and the Pareto distribution. This guy's one of my favorites. You see, Vilfredo Pareto was an Italian engineer, scientist, and philosopher who lived between 1848 and 1923. In his studies, he found that roughly 80% of the land in Italy was owned by 20% of the population. 
After extensive research and a remarkable career, he became chair of political economy at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland, where he discovered an underlying truth about not only the way societies work, but also how most issues and problems and resources are naturally distributed. To begin with, he observed that despite any system of taxation, wealth redistribution, governmental efforts, regardless of any artificial attempts, a small percentage of the population always controls a larger percentage of the wealth or resources. This also is how problems and issues often occur in nature. That is to say, a small set of things, categories, or root causes are often responsible for most of the nature of the phenomena or problem being observed. Thus, the concept of an 80-20 rule was popularized by Vilfredo Pareto while he was university chair in Switzerland. Today, Pareto distributions refer to any distribution where a disproportionate set of outcomes is controlled or predicted by a much smaller set of variables. The point here is that if you group data into categories and the result can be organized into a chart that represents a Pareto-like distribution, you now may know something fundamentally true about the nature of the problem you are facing and how you might focus limited resources to resolve it. By the way, because of a phenomena called the moving bottleneck, once you solve the issues controlled by the identified major category, guess what happens to the remaining problems and issues in a Pareto-like environment? They tend to redistribute themselves into a Pareto-like distribution. And once again, a small number of root causes will account for a disproportionate amount of the problems that remain to be addressed. So why is it so important to note the shape of the data? By the way, much more is written about how to analyze each of these forms than I can cover here. Still, even the minds of children know about how to process and handle shapes long before they know about other things in the world. By considering a brief example, I hope to reveal that you can use this natural ability to understand things about shapes to enable you to also understand things about statistics and the results a data scientist may present to you. Specifically, let's consider when, it, when is a change not a change. Consider the following two normal distributions of data. In this problem, some data measurements were made, a new policy implemented, and then some more data measurements were made. In both cases, the average value of the measurements indicate that a change may be attributed to the implementation of the new policy. However, if we look at the variance about these data measurements, we see that in the top case, we can clearly assert that the policy may be responsible for the observed change. However, in the bottom case, because the variance of the data is so large, we really do not know if the policy is responsible for the observed change or if the change is just due to the result of natural variation, the normal variation in the problem being studied. Let's consider a real life example. This is a true crime story. While the name of the city has been omitted to protect the statistically ignorant, I assure you that these numbers are supported by real data. In this particular city, data was taken from the year 2000 to 2011. The city was frustrated with the crime rate. A new commissioner took charge and implemented some new plans. In 2016, the commissioner announced the success of the new policies. Murders on average were down by 201. Likewise, grand larceny on average was down by 857 a straightforward comparison of the historical averages for each of these categories seemed to support the commissioner's claim of success. But has the commissioner's program truly been successful across all types of crime? Comparing the averages seems to support the commissioner's claim. Knowing that the data is normally distributed around these average values, what happens if we also consider the standard deviation associated with each of these means. Now I want you to pull out a piece of paper 
and compute the significant range around the historical murder rate for 2000 to 2011. And here, let's just consider plus or minus one standard deviation so that you can have some idea what the curve for this data would look like. What's the shape of this data? What's the range of the significant values about the mean? Now do the same thing for the period covering 2012 to 2015. Does it appear to you that the murder rate was really reduced? So far, you might be willing to support the commissioner on the claim that crime has been reduced on all levels. But let's repeat this same exercise for grand larceny. Let's look at plus or minus one standard deviation about the mean for each of these values. Does it appear to you that the grand larceny rate was really reduced? Or is it more likely that a normal variation in the year-to-year -year ebbs and flows of grand larceny rates for this city is what we're seeing here? In both cases, it appears that the average value of the crime was reduced. But when we take into consideration the standard deviation about these average values, a different story is revealed for each category. While data scientists have many more complex and mathematically rigorous methods for determining statistical significance, simply by knowing the shapes of the data and the variance about the data your mind can begin to get a better feel for what is statistically significant and what is just noise. So what you've seen here is that a true statistic consists of characteristics that describe the type of data. It tells us what is significant about the data, what is the variance about the significant point, and how certain we are that this represents the overall population. Oftentimes, the method for collecting the data is considered part of the statistic and must be subject to review. The point here is that truthful statistics lend themselves to review, study, and questioning by reporting all these components. This brings part two of this module to an end. In part three, we will continue with a look at correlations and the scientific method. I look forward to spending more time with you there. Thanks and enjoy.